So welcome everyone. Might uh, get going. Great to hear so many conversations of people catching up at a RMIT housing event. Um, before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the peoples of the Wurrung and Bunurang language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nations on whose lands RMIT conducts its business uh, and acknowledge Elders past, present and emerging and also acknowledge the Indigenous peoples of the lands and waters across Australia where RMIT uh, undertakes its activities uh, and noting that sovereignty was never ceded. So welcome everyone to the launch of uh, the book A Theory of Housing Provision Under Capitalism uh, authored by uh, Mike Berry. Uh, this is an event sponsored uh, by RMIT through RMIT sponsorship in turn of Social Sciences Week which is a week uh, of activities celebrating, promoting, uh, advocating for the social sciences in Australia, uh, led by the Academy of Social Sciences Australia. Uh, RMIT this year is a principal sponsor of Social Science Week, reflecting the great strength we have at this institution uh, in, in social science across a whole raft of disciplines, and which I would note is not always reflected in uh, some of the university's own positioning around enterprise design um, and technology that uh, uh, the, the three headline uh, uh, kind of topics the university promotes. We are very strong in social science, including within the School of Global Urban and Social Studies, uh, where both myself and uh, Mike and uh, others who will be speaking today are, um, are located. So this is a rather wonderful occasion to be launching uh, Mike's new book. Um, I haven't specifically asked Mike how many decades this book has been in preparation, but I believe it's close to 40 years. When was your PhD thesis uh, published, Mike? 25, 30 years ago. Um, so uh, Mike has been at um, RMIT for a very long time. Um, uh, and this book is kind of a, uh, a further product of all the many good works he's done here. Um, just to give a little bit more background on Mike. Um, in addition to his role at RMIT, he's enjoyed a very long and distinguished career in urban regional environmental policy studies internationally. Um, uh, one of the leading lights, I think it's fair to say, in housing studies uh, since the 1970s. He's the author or co-author co of over 100 research reports, books, journal articles, uh, and other publications in housing and urban studies. Uh, and Particularly, um, his work is focused on innovative financing models for uh, social and affordable housing in Australia. He's been very influential in terms of his relationship with uh, governments and with policymakers, uh, including um, leading Ahuri uh, at its inception uh, for what almost a decade, I think, Mike, five years, five years. Uh, he's also served on editorial boards uh, for many academic journals, including Housing Theory and Society and Urban Policy and Research, which is uh, published um, out of RMIT. And he's a regular media con contributor on matters of economic, social and environmental policy. Uh, so I'll let Mike speak uh, in a moment, but just to give a bit of background to the book. Uh, and I think it's really great to see um, Mike's book being launched in the context of Social Science Week, because anyone who's been observing um, the media uh, policy debates in the last uh, year or so would be well aware that housing has come to the fore as a burning policy problem. Uh, I started my own sort of work in housing studies about uh, in Australia about 25 years ago uh, at a time when there was a great deal of disinterest uh, at the federal level and increasingly at the state level around um, promotion of public and affordable housing. Uh, and uh, I must must admit it felt like infertile terrain to be uh, commencing PhD studies and then building a career around specifically social and affordable housing. Um, the context has changed dramatically in the last few years as the chickens of the, I guess, neoliberal turn in housing policy and the withdrawal of the state from direct provision of social and uh, affordable housing uh, has, or well, the, the consequences of that withdrawal have become increasingly manifest as the market systems uh, through which most housing in Australia is provided uh, have started to show uh, 
their internal contradictions and the effects of those contradictions on um, uh, whether it's homeowners or aspirant homeowners uh, and renters and those who dwell in social and affordable housing. So it's very timely to be having uh, or to be seeing the, the publication of a book that takes a very explicit critical focus or perspective on uh, housing systems and systems of housing provision as uh, Mike has done and even even further to do that through a very explicitly Marxist perspective uh, built in the political economy established by Marx and um, interpreters of his work um, and applying that to uh, to housing. Uh, in the book, Mike offers what is perhaps a little slightly bold claim, but um, the first coherent Marxist analysis of the central importance of housing in the social reproduction of capitalism as a whole. But I think in terms of my knowledge of the literature, a volume like this, which is a, a systematic sort of end to end account of the housing system, I'm not aware of anyone who's done that previously. There have been plenty of articles and, and books that sort of uh, give different angles of that perspective. But I think that's probably a fair claim, uh, Mike. So we'll, um, we'll let you away with that. Um, Mike argues that the circulation of capital and re revenues through housing in the built environment help explain how capital labour relations constrain housing outcomes while also being reproduced on an extended scale. Uh, he addresses a whole raft of issues within uh, housing debates and housing policy, uh, including questions of the uh, relationship of uh, financial capital to building and property capital, how land can be understood through theories of land rents, drawing on Marx's uh, categories of rent, uh, how housing is central to the reproduction of labour power um, and uh, uh, human life, uh, and the gendering and uh, demographic dimensions of wider questions of home um, uh, and um, sort of uh, uh, class position within uh, housing systems. He also investigates the role of the state in housing provision and in the relationship between housing and the built environment. So. Congratulations, Mike. Um, now I'd like to invite you to give us a brief overview of your book and some of the key insights. Um, we'll give Mike about 20 minutes to present his uh, insights and, and um, overview of the book, and then we'll have uh, some panel conversation. So over to you, Mike. Thanks, Jago. Thanks, family. Uh, thanks, friends. Thanks, colleagues. Early in 1974, my family and I were evicted from our flat in Kew. This was as surprising as it was outrageous to a very young and privileged baby boomer. Um, but being law-abiding citizens, we duly left the place and we moved in with a friend of the family for a few weeks until the house we were buying was settled and we made our privileged baby boomer escape into home ownership an escape route that many, many people in similar circumstances today simply do not have. About the same time I read in the Age newspaper, I'd come from, from Sydney via Canberra, so the Age newspaper was a, uh, an incredible discovery for me at the time. I mean, in Sydney, all the newspapers were, were being snapped up by Rupert at that stage. and um, I was unused to seeing critical journalism in front of me, but that particular article uh, talked about a young recently admitted barrister, Mike Salvaris, Michael Salvaris, who'd also been evicted and was similarly outraged. And he called a public meeting um, to discuss how to set up a tenants union to argue for a better, a better deal for, for tenants. So I went along to the meeting. Um, it was auspiced by the Brother to St. Lawrence and a small action research organisation in Fitzroy called the Centre for Urban Research and Action. Um, which had been started a few years earlier by two Methodist ministers, one of whom was Brian Howe. A little later, I published my first academic paper, a journal article with the title, Whose City? The Forgotten Tenant. In it, I used data presented by Ronald Henderson in his National Poverty Inquiry that had just come out, uh, which demonstrated, and I was able to demonstrate that private tenants were on average twice as likely to be living under an austere poverty line than everybody else in Australia. And in this was particularly the case, of course, with Indigenous people. Um, sounds familiar, doesn't it? I mean, 
we're in a situation that is even worse, much, much worse than when I started to get interested in housing. A little later, I published a couple of book chapters. One was called Tenant Politics, which uh, drew on work I was doing politically with the Tenants Union. And the second was just called Inequality. Now, as I look back, it wasn't obvious at the time, but as I look back, those events, personal, political and academic, set the contours of my academic life for the next 40 plus years, culminating in the production of the book uh, that uh, uh, Jago talked about. Um, I argue that housing is a complex, multi-layered uh, social construct and it has to be understood within a sophisticated, coherent analytical framework rather than some sort of piecemeal, um, impressionistic, um, latest fad, uh, latest factor that will solve everything approach. And this is what I tried to do and set out in, in my book. I think that with exceptions, housing policy and analysis over the last 40 years of neoliberalism has been lazy, it's been complacent and it's been shallow. So what I'm looking for is a method that develops a very deep analytical understanding of the subject at hand, because I think housing is central to uh, social life and what is happening in our country today. The first thing to note is to get away from any idea that there's such a thing as the housing market. There are many housing sub-markets differentiated by type, size, quality, functionality, tenure and location. And those housing sub-markets interact in all sorts of complex ways uh, that can't be grasped by some sort of simplistic supply and demand housing market analysis. Um, the method I use draws on the philosophy of science proposed by Roy Baskar and Ron Hurray and sociologists like William Althwaite, Russell Keat and uh, Andrew Sayer. I also draw, as, as uh, Jago said, on the work of Marx from uh, his great book Capital and the work of the urban geographer uh, David Harvey. This particular approach argues for a social ontology what exists socially in society, and there is such a thing called society, Mrs. Thatcher. Um, what exists in, in society is and must be approached from a sort of a three level approach. So Bascar distinguishes between the realm of the real, the actual and the uh, empirical. What we observe empirical has a lot to do with what Bascar taught about causal mechanisms and tendencies creating actual effects which may or may not be observed depending on how those uh, structural forces and, and tendencies work themselves out uh, interactively. The best uh, metaphor I can give you is of a perfectly spherical ball placed on a perfectly horizontal table. If you take your hand away, it's to happen. The, the ball just sits there and yet there are the forces of gravity pushing down and an equal and opposite force exerted by the table pushing back up. The end result being that two tendencies cancel each other out. And this often happens. What you observe and what you, particularly what you don't observe is because of the way in which the tendencies driving outcomes, actual outcomes, are not creating a noticeable change in the, in the status quo or the current situation. So what I'm looking for are those sorts of structural tendencies that interact in ways which are able to explain what housing is provided, to whom, where, at what cost, and with what social consequences. Part, uh, the book itself is divided into five parts with an introduction which explains the method in much more detail. Um, part one starts, as Marx did, with housing as a commodity, that primarily new housing is produced as a commodity, that is, by profit-seeking capitalists producing a, a product that is then on sold to the final user, either the homeowner or the landlord investor. So what determines the price at which that occurs, according to a Marxist analysis, is really generated by the underlying causal force of the commitment of paid labour power in the production process. And the end price reflecting the, the quantity of so, what Marx calls socially necessary labour power going into its construction results in a tendency towards a particular selling price in the market. But that price is greater than the value of the commodities that go into uh, 
production of the house and into the wage for the wage labour. So part of the value is what Marx called surplus value, which joins the total mass of surplus value produced in the economy at large, which is then redistributed in the form of what he calls prices of production across the economy caused by the flow, the competitive flow of capital across the economy seeking maximum profits with the end result that profit tends to be equalised across uh, all industries and sectors. But those prices of production, including for housing, is further modified by what we're, we might call the tendency or law of monopoly. So that those capitalists able to exert monopoly power within housing, within land development, within other industries, are able to increase their prices at the expense of other capitalist firms. So there's a double distribution of mass, the massive surplus value produced uh, by the commitment of labour and the advance of capital uh, in the production process. And I explain in that first part what that process looks like and how, and how it works out. It's also the case that uh, in the production and sale of new housing, and I'm talking about new housing specifically here, um, there are other sorts of capital investors involved. There's a whole range of property capital investors, um, various exchange professionals, agents, uh, designers, lawyers, valuers, and so forth. And there are also, of course, the commitment of financial capital. The banks in particular get involved in providing what Marx called interest-bearing capital. Now, those capitals are also up for a profit and partake in the general distribution of this massive social surplus value produced in the economy, but they are not directly productive of that surplus value. They extract in a quasi-rent type form their profit. Uh, it has to be equalised across the, uh, uh, the economy subject to uh, the law of monopoly, but there is this tendency to think of everything that goes into the housing sector as being somehow productive. The Marxist analysis distinguishes productive investment from non-productive investment. However, all investment by capitalists has to, has to gain a profit uh, for the individual capitalist unless they go out of business. We all we know in Australia, not so much in other capitalist countries, but in Australia there's also a penumbra, penumbra of what Marx called petty commodity producers, including the army of ute driving tradies, so beloved by conservative politicians. These are self-employed people who own their means of production, who own their ute, who own their tools, who, own, who buy their uh, materials and directly produce the product, but they are not part of the flow of capital through, directly through the housing sector. The capital that goes into the big uh, uh, building supplies uh, industries are, but not specifically the labour committed by commodity, uh, petty commodity producers. So that's an important point to note in Australia. In other countries, uh, you have a much uh, greater impact by uh, manufactured housing, by large capitalist construction companies and firms often integrated with the land development process. But of course, new housing comes on the general market in a situation where most of the sales every year are of existing houses. There's a secondhand market for housing as there is for, for, for cars. And there are all sorts of complex, complex interactions between new housing and existing housing submarkets, um, which have to be teased out at the level of the empirical. There are different um, uh, um, causal tendencies, pushing outcomes that can be observed in those areas. But as I've just indicated, housing is only one part of the housing system. The other part is land. Housing needs a site. Housing needs land to, uh, to, to exist on, it, whether it's single uh, level housing or it's jacked up in high rise densified housing. Um, and I'm about to depart, uh, Reserve Bank Governor has, in, has stated that we don't have a housing crisis, we have a land crisis. And that's in partly because in an urban context, land often is a very significant and sometimes a, ma a major portion of the land house package, the price uh, that uh, is, is created through the process I've been talking about and the short terms up, ups and downs in supply and demand. Mm -hmm. um, but this is um, this is uh, deceptive 
Landowners certainly gain a significant price, but it's a rental extraction from the total profit that's realised, not just in construction, but within the, the economy at large. So part two takes up in detail the question of the land component of the land house commodity and develops a theory of urban ground rent, uh, utilising Marx's category of, uh, of differential and monopoly rents. Um, Rent is terribly important in the urban context because in particular, the anticipation of future rents tends to drive the uses to which land is put. What sort of housing, where, uh, whether it replaces non-residential uses and so on. So a theory of urban land rent is the critical hinge of the book and it really can't be understood. Well, my argument can't be, can't be understood without a, a detailed uh, discussion of how urban land rent generates urban change and urban development across across the metro regions of our countries. So processes like gentrification, gated communities, uh, densification, the move to densification is all about understanding how urban ground rent works its its way out, particularly in relation to what the government does, uh, which I get to in part four of the book. So part two just develops the basic theory of urban ground rent, but it's not complete until we get uh, to the role of the state in part four. But there's another trend that we observed in actual prices of the land house package in Australia, and that's a steady upward trend in the, the land house package. We have booms and then we have sort of slight modifications and then booms again, but overall an upward trend in the package. Now this comes from a number of reasons. Firstly, uh, driven by population growth and urban centralization, continuing urbanization, putting a premium on particular sites. It uh, comes from quality improvements. New housing is, is introducing all sorts of new labor intensive and therefore costly reflected in the price. Uh, functions of the house, which then revert back into the existing stock through patterns of, uh, of renovation, both do it yourself and by capitalist builders. They're also, uh, it's also related to increasing economic inequality in, in capitalist mm -hmm. societies. What happens is that housing, new housing and existing housing is continually through the process of, of rent extraction and generation and the input of more and more expensive labor being dragged up market and away from the affordable end of the market. So affordable housing is always a problem in market driven capitalist systems. Um, the metaphor I, I use, I borrow from David Harvey. He talks about a theater and people queuing up outside the theater to get in. And you get in by paying the ticket price and the queue is structured according to uh, how much money you have in your pocket, more money you have, further up the queue you are, the more likely you are to get into the theatre. Eventually, all the seats will be sold, house full sign will go up, and the people who miss out are still in the queue outside. And the problem is not just that there's a queue of people, in this analogy, uh, homeless people, it's a queue that keeps growing uh, because more and more people with money in their pocket are pushing in further up, closer to the, to the, to the entrance pushing people who don't have the money further and further down. People who push in are skilled migrants who come in, wealthy migrants who come in, uh, people with wealth who move from uh, the country area into the city, and the children of affluent people who've already got inside and are buying seats for their kids to join them. Um, but there's a, there's a simpler metaphor, just think of the bathtub, you know, with the water gushing in faster than it's leaking out through the plug hole. Eventually, the uh, water level rises and overflows the bath and the overflow are the homeless, the people at the back of the queue. Part three moves on to look at the wider social significance of housing in a capitalist society. I talk about the reproduction of capitalism on an extended scale. In short, uh, healthy capitalists need healthy and compliant workers. Healthy and compliant workers need to be adequately housed or at least minimally housed and with a whole lot of other um, act, um, 
uh, access to basic facilities and services for themselves and their children. That's why, clearly, from late in the 19th century, the state became in intimately involved in town planning, in public housing, in public health and hygiene, uh, and in other ways of trying to establish uh, a workable, exploitable labour force for capital. There's also uh, another point associated with monopoly. Monopoly tends to be not in Australia's construction industry, partly because of all the small scale producers out there. But there is monopoly in the land development sector and large land developers are able to uh, extract uh, monopoly rents by slowing the overall release of developed land. So land banking is a major issue in terms of what happens to uh, housing prices in, in our country. But housing is also the material container for what I call the home and the distinction between housing and the home, between shelter and the home. So nine and 10, chapters nine and 10 focus on the social construction of a home as a base for domestic relations of production based on gender and demographic lines and the intergenerational socialization of members of the household within the household and within the local community. By that I mean the sorts of values and views of the world that uh, people take on and develop uh, through the life course. The home is also, of course, a container for the penetration of capitalist consumer goods. Um, and also, I argue, potentially a, a counter site, a, a, a counter uh, base for opposition to the logic of, of capital and the uh, constraint on on uh, on uh, on lived lives. It's also the place where capitalists can create a new precarious class of electronic gig workers. So homework is becoming increasingly uh, sort of um, eluding the, the distinction between house as shelter and house as home. An unloved ex-federal treasurer once said, to get a good house, just get a good job. Well, you can actually switch that around. Get a good house and you have access to good jobs and good schools for your kids and health facilities and shopping and other urban services and a whole range of mobility access to environmental uh, benefits. Part four finally brings in the state and I argue that um, the state centrally implicated in housing provision, and I debunk the notion that in any sense housing outcomes are, in a, are purely the result of market forces. Chapter 13 traces the link between housing wealth and political influence and the agenda power of property interests in keeping things exactly as they are. Think about the fate of the Labor Party at the 2019 election. Chapter 14 moves on and looks at the interaction between housing provision, financial capital and the macro economy. At the moment, housing has become a critical link between that particular sector and the broad macro economy. And what happens in housing is important, not just because it employs people and it produces commodities, but also because it's a link that increases the instability of capitalism as a whole. And there are all sorts of feedback links through wealth effects and so on. Um, And I talk a little about what happened in the global financial crisis as an indication of that. Part five finally focuses on what to do. And here I argue for, I guess, what the Financial Review calls the Bolshevization of, uh, of uh, RMIT, um, a radical program of social democratic reform, by which I, would, I mean breaking that basic class power relation between capital and labor. The idea that to survive, you've got a choice between working at the going market wage or starving. Freedom to starve is not freedom, it's not choice. Uh, so what I'm suggesting is bringing on board a, a very generous minimum income scheme. And by generous, I mean something like 50% of average full-time weekly earnings, which today would be about $50,000 a year. The idea of that being a minimum that all adults uh, are guaranteed so if you learn le less than that, the government tops you up. If you earn more than that, you pay taxes to help pay for the topping up. Now, clearly something like that's going to involve a massive pro progressive redistribution. 
of income and wealth through progressive taxes. Wealth in particular is largely untaxed in this country, particularly for those up, up at the top. Um, but even then, because of that upward trend in the capitalist economy of the land housing package, particularly in urban situations, the government is always going to have to have a direct provision role for something like the bottom 20% of the income and wealth hierarchy at any time. So it doesn't get you away from direct provision in education, in health, in housing, in aged care, childcare, and so on. But it does create a situation of genuine housing justice, I would argue. In concluding thoughts, I point to how uh, what I'm talking about is specific. The analysis is specific to Western capitalist societies like ours. Other capitalisms exist. Think of uh, um, capitalism with Chinese characteristics and the various forms of mafia capitalism in Central Asia and authoritarian capitalism in Eastern Europe. You can't use this sort of analysis to understand what's going on there with respect to housing, health, education, jobs or anything else. You really need to look at the networks of uh, patronage, um, nepotism, corruption. And the best uh, book on this that I've read recently is by the political philosopher John Keane. His book, The New Despotisms, talk about how you might look at what's happening in those sorts of society. And there are other ways of, of approaching housing in our society, of course. Just finally, on reading the book, when I published the book by Palgrave Macmillan is owned by uh, Springer Science, which is the largest academic publisher in the world by a mile. And they have a business model which is filtered right through the academic presses. And that is, you produce a book and you put an impossibly high price on it. And you sell that along with the complete package of electronic access to the university libraries and other libraries so that all staff and students have access to it. But they have a, a second string to their bow. They sell each individual chapter to individuals like you and I. The problem is, if you think about it, to sell an individual chapter, you've got to have a bibliography for each chapter. So there's a bibliography for each chapter there. But if you've been following the method I'm suggesting, taking a chapter out of context will only give you so much. It won't give you the whole argument. Unfortunately, if you're going to read my book properly, you've got to start at the beginning and get through to the end. It's probably the bad news you don't want to hear today. Um, when I pointed out, the contradiction to my publisher. There was sort of a stunned silence. And I said, but this is the way we all do it. And I said, yeah, but it doesn't work with my book. What do you think happened? There's a bibliography in every chapter. <laughs> I was in the position of the, the small farmer trying to deal with Woolworths. If you're dealing with a monopolist, you get screwed one way or the other. On that optimistic note, I'm going to leave it. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Mike, for that great overview. Um, I should just note before we call the panel to uh, the stage, um, I have not yet seen until now a hard copy version of that book, um, which partly arises from the fact that uh, so much is digitised these days. That I think it's mostly available in uh, print on demand rather than um, than, than a, a full print run being undertaken right at the outset. Um, we had hoped to have a screen uh, behind the stage here with a QR code that you could uh, go onto your phone and zap it and that would take you to uh, the sales page for um, the book if you wish to purchase, purchase a copy or an individual chapter. Um, uh, however, the uh, facilities here haven't allowed that. But what we will do is um, out in the foyer, there will be a copy of the QR code uh, uh, stuck to the wall where we'll be having lunch afterwards. Um, but also we'll send through to all of those who registered for uh, this event um, information about the book where you can access it. I would note, as Mike has, um, has already said, that uh, academics uh, at institutions that have subscriptions to Springer, Palgrave Macmillan, or whatever the conglomerate is called, um, uh, should be able to access both a PDF version um, and an EPUB version um, through the university uh, library, whether it's the full, uh, the full book or just chapters. I must admit, I've, I went for the EPUB version um, uh, uh, about halfway through it on my um, 
my e-reader. So um, that is that is viable for those who have access there. I must apologise on Mark's behalf uh, to the wider public who might wish to be purchasing the book at um, at a at a you know, reasonable rate, similar to other uh, other books. Um, so that's just a bit of uh, detail about the book. Um, we've now got a uh, august panel that we're going to invite uh, to the stage. So could I invite the the panelists to come up to share their reflections and observations about uh, Mike's book and its relevance and application to uh, contemporary debates and issues in housing policy. Grab a seat. So on the panel today, we have Emeritus Professor David Hayward uh, towards the end there. Um, David uh, is a former Dean of the School of Global Urban and Social Studies at RMIT and has previously worked in the university's uh, policy strategy and impact team. Uh, and he now sits on the University Council providing uh, insights and advice from his uh, long experience as a leader and manager in higher education to uh, the university in that role. Uh, I'd also like to invo invite uh, Priya Kunjan, uh, who is uh, a research fellow within the Centre for Urban Research uh, and has a background in uh, questions of uh, Indigenous justice and is now working on uh, current research around dwelling justice with uh, Libby Porter and David Kelly. Uh, and then uh, finally, I'd welcome uh, Liam Davies, who is a lecturer within the Social, uh, sorry, Sustainability and Urban Planning Programme uh, and uh, a researcher within the Centre for Urban Research within the School of Global Urban and Social Studies and has only very recently uh, completed a PhD um, examining uh, rental housing in Victoria through a, I guess, a post-Marxist uh, regulation theory perspective as well. Uh, so thanks to our panellists for uh, uh, participating in the event today and to start off, uh, I'll maybe ask David, uh, noting that you also have a, a background in um, political economy inquiry, uh, not just in housing, but why is it important in the contemporary environment to study housing and housing policy from a political economy perspective? I think that, can you all hear me up the back there, Vince? Um, <clears throat> just before I say anything about more general, I just wanted to sure. acknowledge Mike's significant contribution to urban studies more generally, but also RMIT. Uh, Mike is a genuine, one of the giants of uh, urban studies um, at RMIT and your legacy is tremendous, Mike. And just as a little anecdote, when I first came to RMIT as a young, I think I just finished my undergraduate degree and I, Mike invited me in to meet with him. I think Building 80 had just been finished and it had been, it was pouring with rain. And when I went into his office, he had a bucket and he was on level four and the bucket was collecting water. And Mike said, don't even bother to ask. <laughs> <clears throat> so that building has been very, um, a very interesting throughout its whole lifetime. Um, but uh, Jacob, just to return to your question, I think with housing, we tend to pick up a personal aspect to it. We all relate to housing. We all have a history with housing. We remember our homes or being evicted or not being evicted. We have happy moments, we have bad moments. And so we tend to individualise um, experiences. And then also we tend to uh, think about housing in terms of immediate causes of problems. It's the government's fault. Um, and I think, um, or it might be a builder that's done something badly. What it's difficult for people to do is to see the systems that are involved in what our experiences are and how they link up with history and how they compare his, his, um, over time and space. Uh, so I think the significance of the political economy approach is that it does exactly that. And, and most importantly, most importantly it reminds us that at the end of the day, the, the most significant question to do with housing provision is always about politics and power. Um, and I think people like to try and make it more technical. They go, it's about economics, finance, difficult things. At the end of it, it's politics and power. So I think that that's why that approach is so important to us these days. Thanks, David. Priya, uh, some opening remarks from you. Yeah, um, well, I'd, I'd also just like to start um, by acknowledging that we are meeting on Oirong and Bunurong country, unceded stolen land. And I think that's, you know, a particularly apropos to note during a conversation about housing and land where land is such a, 
central part of the conversation um, and where there's this uh, creation or, or reinvention, as um, Michael Storper put it, of, of this urban frontier in the center of the city, um, you know, through financialization of housing. And um, I guess, you know, coming from the, the, the research area that that I'm in, which is looking at questions of dwelling justice. Um, I found Mike's book, you know, particularly uh, incisive in its analysis of uh, the creation of housing as an asset and the and the creation of housing as almost fungible. Um, and so the political economy uh, perspective really uh, brings to bear how these economic relations, but also political and social relations factor into how dwelling is experienced. Um, so yeah, I, I think uh, there's a really important question there picking up from the centrality of politics uh, to looking at the stolenness of the land we're on as a consideration of um, yeah, the the housing question in this place. Great, thank you, Priya. Um, Liam, opening thoughts. Um, I think, wow. Like, to be honest, that's the first one. Um, I, I'm i going to reflect a little bit and then kind of go from there. I first met Mike when I was in my honours year in 2017 and started a PhD the next year with actually almost everyone here with David Anjago as supervisors and Mike as an independent. And I did use a political economy approach to housing for exactly the same reasons David suggested just before that it is one way of looking at housing and society in a totality. It's a way of looking at the economy and politics as not two separate things, but as an entwined, a dialectically entwined phenomenon that occurs through our society. But in my first year, Mike, as the independent on my panel, said you need to contain your scope and you need to contain how much you're trying to do. And I did. And in the second year, I got the same thing and I did. And in the third, it was like, I think it's right now. Just finish it. <laughs> so I was kind of delighted to hear that this took you 40 years because I was like, <laughs> blimey, how did you do that? <clears throat> Through that, I did also have a reasonably severe pandemic. I don't know if you know that happened and decided to ride read Marx's Capital and I am impressed at how much Mike has managed to use those concepts and those tools and those thoughts that were written 150 years ago in a very modern context while simultaneously making it a quarter the size and deeply <laughs> accessible while still starting with the commodity form and MCM or MCM Prime. I'd also just like to end with one minor thing that in the editor's notes of the start of Capital, there is a large discussion where Marx too was tried to force to syndicate his book under cat chapters <laughs> and suggested it's just not possible. It <laughs> must be read from start to finish. Thanks, Liam. A very old tactic there. Uh, um, uh, by the publishing industry, extracting as much rent as it can from its authors. Um, I guess a question I have for everyone, and Mike, you're welcome to comment on this as well, is why is it that the newspapers are so full of housing uh, day to day? Um, what is it that, ha that has happened in the last few years that has put housing on the daily front pages in a way that perhaps 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago, it was still there in the politics and in the in the, in the you know, public debates, but not at the forefront the way it has become. What, what's, what's shifted in the last few years that has placed housing so, um, so central to current policy discussions? And, and how is that founded in the kind of ideas that Mike has put forward in his book? Mike? If you'd like to start. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, look, uh, the simple answer is the dam is breaking. What we've had is a build up of pressure, of water pressure for decades, ever since we moved on to this neoliberal trajectory of political economy. And we had massive under provision at the bottom end of the housing market. 
and housing markets capitalistically driven do not cater for that end of the market. But it's not just the people at the bottom end, it's increasing the people in the middle, because what we're seeing is a disappearing middle. We're seeing a, a bifurcation and a move back, interestingly, much more towards the sort of um, bipolarization economically, financially, that we saw in the 19th century that caused Marx to write his book in the first place. We now have a situation where in Australia, something like um, 20 percent of the total wealth of the country are owned by the top 0.1 percent. Something like 60 percent of the total wealth is owned by the top 20 percent. This is a massively unequal society. And I should say that, as I do in the book, that housing is a way, is one of the factors, housing ownership and land ownership and exploitation is one of the ways in which uh, what that wealth is being accumulated and passed on through the class structure to the children of the well-off. Um, so this is why I say that what we need is a far-reaching reform agenda. So why are we seeing it now? Well, the children of editors are starting to find it difficult to find rental housing, let alone buy rental housing. The escape into home ownership has been denied for the children of what used to be called the middle class, the waning middle class. There is changing in the class structure. I can't remember the chapter now. I think it's 12, 11 or 11, um, where I talk about that fracturing and fragmentation of classes in our society. So critically, housing has become an issue because the dam is about to break. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Liam, any thoughts on this? Um, basically, yeah, we've, we've opened up housing as far too much of a commodity form. We've stepped back from a, and I won't say non-commodity because I'll get devil's eyes from three people up here, um, from a less commodified form of housing provision through state government and through non-for-profits. And what we've moved towards is a full commodification of housing in what Harvey would call the secondary circuit of capital that it's being used as a store of value, but the more that it gets used as a store of value without an ability to create more and more and more of it endlessly because of monopoly land, the more that it becomes sought after as a store of value, the same as gold. But we don't live in gold, we live in houses and we turn them into homes, so we create an existential crisis. And that, I think, is exactly what's happening in a simpler form. Yep, the dam is overflowing. Korea. Yeah, I'd, um, I'd like to um, pick up on something that David mentioned earlier as well, which is the fact that, you know, housing is a very immediate concern for, for everyone. And so uh, when these pressures start being, uh, start to be felt even more acutely, when the uh, dam starts feeling that, that sense of expansion and that, you know, the levee's about to break, um, it's something that is felt at a, very individual sense. Everybody sort of has an analysis of housing, of how the housing system works, has to interface with the with the real estate, um, you know, industry and with various property markets and sub markets, um, as uh, Mike has referred to. And I think it's also this awareness of, uh, or an increasing awareness of the incongruity between, um, I guess, the Australian dream that is being sold of uh, of home ownership and of those ideals and uh, how the reality is actually so much further away from that. But I also can see that there is then, uh, I guess, a bit of a discursive battle that's happening within the media space as well between uh, folks who've been raising this question for a very long time and people who are only now realizing that they have a much greater proximity to these concerns than they did before. So there's also a bunch of uh, different ways that this conversation is textured by uh, people who have always been on the receiving end of, of those concerns and how, I guess, class interests as well affect the nature of the political solutions being put forth by people who are now finding themselves affected by these issues. Um, yeah, look, thanks, um, Jago. From my point of view, one of the big issues with the Australian housing system at the production end is highly unstable. So if you look at the annual 
uh, a change in dwelling completions. You go back all the way to 1950, you can see that the booms and slumps are getting more and more pronounced. So it's profoundly unstable. And then to make it worse, the subcontracting system that we have for labour, which is not something uniform across Western countries, is there was a political battle in the 50s and 60s about whether building labour would be directly employed or subcontracted. And the builders won and they made it subcontracted labour. That only makes it worse because you end up with situations where all of a sudden you've got too many workers and so the building industry goes into a slump and then all of a sudden you've got too little. Um, problems compound, shortages of material, shortage of labour. Um, and then at the, at the end of the day, you've got this uh, the phenomenon Mike talked about with land ownership and land firms that do have an interest in land banking to try and increase the rent that they can extract through the sale of the final dwelling to the consumer. So it's getting more and more complex because governments in response have decided that they're going to embrace markets. So at the moment, the federal treasury estimates that the annual subsidy to housing is in the order of $50 billion a year, 50 billion, right? It's not like governments have withdrawn, they've actually extended their involvement. But at the same time, the involvement has been around how do you make money out of housing, not how do you deliver housing as something that people need. And so I think what's now prevailing in a, as a cultural sense, which I haven't seen before, the number of people that I meet who say, I'm a landlord and I have a right to be a landlord and aren't I good because I'm letting somebody live in my house and look, they don't look after it very well. How bad are they? Um, so there's a kind of like, from what I recall, there's a very strong sentiment, um, cultural sentiment in Australia around home ownership. There's become a shift so that housing very much is seen as something to make money out of. Um, and in the middle of all that are people who are missing out and feeling the heat because the market doesn't work well. And then we get a movement now culturally of yes in my backyard. The yes in my backyard is in my view is about as evil a political movement as you could possibly want because what it's going to do is to lead to further neoliberal reforms that created the problem to begin with. It's not going to solve it. Um, so we do, we have a mess. We genuinely have a mess. And I think that's why Mike's book is very timely because it'll remind us it's systematic. Um, it's not just about government subsidy, it's more than that. Um, and it is only going to get worse. But at the same time, a lot of people, and Mike, interestingly, at the beginning of your book, I think it's on page three, you say, so for the, for the, I think you say for the large majority of people, their housing situation in the West has actually improved quite a lot um, over time and space. The issue is not the majority, as Mike points out, it's the minority. And I think that's where the crux comes in. An increasing number of people are feeling the crunch in a system that no longer even aspires to help them. It's really become one geared to making money out of not delivering social need. I think that's the kind of how I'd answer that question, why it's going to keep being on the front pages. Great. Thanks, David. Mike, I think you had a comment to make further. Yeah, it's just that um, <clears throat> David, uh, reminded me of something which I've just forgotten listening to him. Um, so I'll go on to something that Priya reminded me of. Uh, an Ahuri project I had um, a couple of de decades ago involved setting up a focus group with a group of Indigenous uh, women housing workers working in Indigenous housing. And I was struck um, by a number of things that came out of that um, uh, eye-opening uh, discussion for me. Uh, but one thing I'll never forget, um, we were talking about discrimination, obvious uh, uh, thing to talk about when you talk about uh, Indigenous uh, housing. And one of the very uh, articulate um, housing workers said, look, she and her partner both had good jobs. But uh, when they applied for rental housing, she always sent her husband because he had lighter skin. And that's something I, I never forgot. I thought discrimination is so deep, so pervasive and so casual. Um, and uh, I've totally forgotten what I was going to say to you, David. I'll catch up with you. That quite often happens, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> um, so moving on from the kind of the politics of housing, but to um, uh, the housing system itself, and there's a lot of conversation that um, the housing market is constrained by various forms of state regulation. I think you sort of alluded to that a bit, David, in your remarks about um, uh, about Yimbyism. Um, uh, I guess the question I have to everyone is, can markets ever solve housing problems without state intervention or, or, or through complete deregulation? Uh, and if not, um, how should we change our current state interventions? Obviously, you've mentioned um, uh, the subsidy system. 
uh, concession, tax concessions and so forth, David, but how should we change our state intervention into housing systems to Im improve whether it's the functioning of markets or to go beyond markets in terms of provision? I'll kick that off if you like, Jago. It's been interesting uh, earlier this year, Liam had a trip to um, the Netherlands. He might like to talk about it a bit more. And a colleague of mine, Terry Burke, had a trip to Sweden and they both looked at the way that housing provision is organised in those countries. And it's interesting about the significance of local government, that the role that they take in assembling land and then um, identifying a concept for building, uh, for a building, a mass building project that's integrated and it takes into account demographics and um, different dwelling types, uh, um, but to make sure it's an integrated uh, development, integrated with services, public transport and so on and so forth. We have a completely different approach here um, <clears throat> that is one that doesn't work because everything is separated and everything is privatised and money is at the end of all um, questions. And um, I think one clear example would be for us to be thinking about those models that apply in parts of Europe we tend not to look at and how we might learn from them. I mean, one of the interesting things I think um, to, is are the different institutional co configurations of answers to the housing question. We tend in Australia to look at the United States, the United Kingdom, New Zealand and Canada. And I'd probably say in terms of housing policy, they're the last places I'd look at as examples for good housing policy, which raises a question, a good question in itself about how our policy choices are made and framed and what we see is feasible and not feasible. Um, and somewhere in here, it would be nice to hear from Michael Buxton because um, he's been talking about this for a very long time as a planner about the way that the system operates to point the finger at planners um, as if planners are responsible for shortages of land that cause house prices to go up, um, which leads to further deregulation, which leads to further um, catastrophes, um, building deregulation. It's an interesting, it's an interesting situation we find ourselves in, but I do wish we'd look to Northern Europe more to see what the answers might be. Mike, I'm not sure if you've got something to reflect on with that, because you've got a, a magisterial understanding of the different look, housing um, systems. Let me put up front. The Housing Affordability Future Fund won't do much harm, but it won't do much good either. Um, there are a series of very specific housing policy interventions that are being discussed at the moment. Now, some of them will make a, a minor change at the edges, but really the argument I'm saying is that the problems and the inequalities and the injustices are so system systemically embedded, I'm arguing for a full frontal attack on the system that creates the problems that we're trying to fiddle with around the edges. So I'm happy to talk about specific uh, um, policies. Uh, I don't think half is going to be very important at all in the greater scheme of things. Some of the um, you know, built to rent and policies around uh, extended leases and um, greater protection for tenants and so forth, they're all important, but they won't solve the basic problems we've been talking about today. Um, yeah, actually, on um, on that question of of injustices, it, it, it's interesting, kind of looking at how we attend to the distributive question um, around housing justice in this place, and um, you know, looking at that broader political economy perspective, how we then integrate the socio-political concerns that inform the way that land is appropriated um, in this place, because in the research that we're that we're doing at the moment, we're trying to hold those things in tension. You know, the question of housing justice and the question as well of you know colonization and sovereignty and how uh, the wealth generated through the appropriation of indigenous lands and then uh, the extraction of further rents from that land in, in many of the ways that Mike has discussed in the book. Um, how that then informs how we move forwards. And so there's always this skepticism around the role of the state, um, you know, even though there is a lot of uh, a lot of skepticism about what the market is able to provide uh, unregulated, but then the the nature of the regulatory role of the state and the uh, the way that uh, even when in past decades, uh, there has been uh, intensive state intervention uh, for the development of quite a lot of public housing and into public amenities. Uh, you know what that consensus still rests upon, and whether that needs to be troubled as well in part of this broader, um, you know, transformation uh, towards actual tangible dwelling justice for for everyone. 
Thanks, Priya. Liam. Um, <clears throat> I don't think we can deregulate ourselves to affordable housing. I think that what we've seen is a deregulatory regime which has decreased affordability significantly. And I think that it's also not historically accurate to look back and think about how we created a, a wage earners welfare state or based on home ownership through the 1950s and 60s. And I've got a couple of examples and I'd like to touch on what David mentioned before. I've been reading through old annual reports of the Housing Commission of Victoria, half because I'm kind of geeky and half because it was somewhat useful for a research project. And I stumbled upon a section of it in the late 1960s where they were talking about how they basically reclaimed too much slum land and they were starting to sell it off because they didn't want large concentrations. And I was like, oh, that's funny because I've always wondered about this block in North Carlton. Why is there a block of flats opposite the cemetery on Ligon Street between Ligon and Drummond, Lee and Uri, that's all flats. The only flats in the whole area, Housing Commission. They cleared the land and they sold it to the private market, did heaps of this in North Melbourne too. And they had to sell it for 50 cents in the dollar. Yeah. And they'd sell it for 50 cents in the dollar. <clears throat> the market was incapable of assembling the land together to create the density uplift. Then, it will be incapable now. We are not going to create larger sites of smaller ones through markets. It's through state acquisition. So I'm not proposing we go back to land rec slum reclamation. But I am suggesting that we're building larger states on the outer suburbs where we're gifting all of the uplift value to private hands. And if we look at areas that have strong affordable and social housing networks. They don't do that. So I was in Netherlands earlier this year and on the outskirts of Utrecht. They've been buying up the farmland for the past 20 years and they buy the farmland, they master plan it, they rezone it, they determine what building form will go on it and then they sell it to the private market. And that's how they fund it. It means that it becomes a self-funding system of what we called, which I learnt from Mike's book of 1983, Australian Urban Economy, land commissions. We tried this in the late 1970s. It was a miserable corrupt failure, but we did try it. And I think those are the forms of state intervention that we have to be thinking about that where does the value from state action go? Does it go to private hands or does it go to the public good? I'll end there. I think that you're going to add. Yeah, I was just going to add some. Um, we're we're sorry, can I just needing to wrap up, but I will give the last word to Mike to just, respond uh, to his interlocutors. It just reminds me of um, what's happening uh, near San Francisco in the Bay Area at the moment. There's a group of um, uh, Silicon Valley uh, billionaires who've been progressively buying up um, a lot of farmland, and they're about to create the world's largest gated estate. A state. It'll be a upmarket high tech, very expensive and totally exclusive uh, appropriation of farmland for the purposes of profit, which is why I've placed on the cover a house embedded in a sea of money. Well, thank you very much, Mike. Um, <laughs> Not, not just a metaphor, it's, uh, it's almost uh, material as well uh, in the current environment. Well, look, uh, we do need to wrap up. Um, so I would like to thank especially Mike Perry for uh, both producing the book and uh, allowing us the honour of uh, helping him launch it today. So thank you, Mike. I'd also like to thank our panel, uh, Liam, Priya and David for their insightful uh, comments and contributions to the conversation. Uh, I'd also like to thank Jenny Lucy for helping organise the session today and for our AV support person as well. And thanks to everyone for coming along and making this a, a really interesting event. We do have some, uh, some lunch and light refreshments uh, out in the foyer, so please feel free to um, stay around and uh, continue the conversation in a, in a more informal setting if you'd like to. Um, so thanks everyone. I hereby declare a theory of housing provision under capitalism uh, duly launched. <laughs>